verse number 11. Let's jump down to verse number 11. The Bible says, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? and of the Son of Man, which shall be made as grass. And forgettest the Lord thy Maker, that hath stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, and hath feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? He's saying, look, I have everlasting joy. I have, I, have, I have all this laid out for you already. It's going to be good. He says, I'm going to be the one that comforts you. I'm the one that's here for you. I'm going to strengthen you. You're going to be worried about this guy? You're going to be worried about this man? Who's afraid of a man that's just going to die? God's like, I'm forever. This fool's going to die. You're worried about this oppressor? And you know what? There may be fury from an oppressor in this world. We can expect that, but don't be afraid of that. Because when you fear, you make all the wrong choices. When you allow fear to enter into your mind, you're going to make the wrong choice. Don't be afraid. Fear not what man can do to you. That's why I love the story in Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because those are perfect examples of facing the fury of the oppressor. King Nebuchadnezzar, who made the, the, the statute of saying, well... When you hear the sound of the music playing, the cornet, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all manner of music, and I know I am probably missed out a few other instruments in my quotation of that passage, but when you hear all the music, you know, you need to bow down and you need to worship the image. And if you don't bow down and worship the image, when you hear the sound of the hornet, sackbut, the psaltery, <laughs> then you'll be cast into a burning, fiery furnace, right? So there's, here is, very real, and now this is not unknown fear, this is known. This is, hey, you don't do this, you're getting cast into that furnace. Yeah. It's not even a, well, I don't know what's going to happen if we don't do this. Right? right? This is, well, that's what's going to happen. You say, well, that's legitimate, Pastor Burzens. What do you expect them to do? I mean, how are they going to be able to reach more people if they're dead? And this is the way that, that Christians want to justify their disobedience to God's word. They'll use this reasoning or logic to explain away why they don't do what they're supposed to do. Watch out for that. It's the same reasoning that says, oh, well, you know, you think that homosexuals should be put to death? Well, I mean, what about them getting saved? I mean, if you put people to death, then there's just no more chance. What if they get saved later on? And this is people where, because they don't like that one stance, and it's like, well, what about the serial killer that you think should be put to death? Shouldn't he be allowed? Shouldn't he get saved? Then you're saying, well, maybe we shouldn't kill anybody because what if they get saved? And then what you're doing is you're judging God's law because God's the one that said they should be put to death. Well, are you more holy and righteous than God? Are you going to judge God? Say, well, God, why didn't you let these people live a little bit longer? Because they might have gotten saved. Right. That's right. It's the stupidity of trying to reason out things. Oh, well, there's a greater good. Just let them live longer because we could reach them. No. Look, if God said it, then that's what's right. Don't go trying to change and be more holy or more loving than God. God. 